Hello, everybody. Welcome to Karma Hub. Today, we're talking with Tom Cronin from Sydney, Australia. He is the author of six books and the producer and co-writer of The Portal, film and book. Through the practice of meditation, Tom has found an enlightened purpose in life. He now is an advocate of personal healing and human transformation. This interview is a little different for me as it focuses less on a particular healing modality and more on a concept, a phase shift, a paradigm shift that we are all in the middle of and how we could best navigate through it. This is an important topic and discussion, so I, I hope that you end up sharing it with others. So please stick around. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much. Crisis is actually a mechanism for evolution. We see companies reach a tipping point. They either break down into bankruptcy or they break through with a new way of doing things. We see relationships <laughs> get to a tipping point where they either break down into divorce or they break through into whole new levels of doing things. And unfortunately, humankind tends to be quite stubborn and resistant. And so we wait till that tipping point before we either break down or break through. It's really, really exciting what's happening. It's just, it's not happening the way we would expect it to happen. What we normally expect to happen is political leaders, business leaders, um, you know, voices in the world uh, at higher levels would normally be the ones that determine change. So the change can only come from the ground up. It can only come from individuals shifting their own consciousness. And what we're seeing is that instead of it coming from the top down, it's actually gonna come from the bottom up. And the expectation on business leaders and political leaders to, um, to represent a new status quo that the masses are demanding is gonna to start to happen. So I think this is a very early stage of a new situation of um, humankind starting to reorganize itself of its own accord and not waiting for some person in power that's been uh, put in there by some large organizations that are self-interested. I think we're gonna see um, some very dynamic shifts taking place. There is this unified interconnected field that when we transcend the physical, mental and emotional reality of our own individual need and existence, we by default start to experience this connectivity with other being other animals, plants and humans at a level that you can't really describe. You just know it's there. And so it's very right. hard to start to harm or hurt or feel anything but love and connectivity with other because you are actually experiencing other as you. It's an extension of you just as the finger and the toe are interconnected in the body. And so my intention is to bring meditation and inspire people to meditate more because when we start to meditate, we start to transcend physical, mental and emotional field and access this interconnective web of unification. And that allows us to be a lot more caring, kind and compassionate with others. If you could start by telling us a little bit about why you're doing what you're doing, you have your hands in a number of things. I understand you kind of started in finance. Um, you discovered meditation maybe to cope with having to work in finance is my guess. Actually, there's kind of a laundry list of things that you're doing at the moment, but can you tell me, um, I mean, quickly, like what your journey has been, why you've taken those steps and, and what exactly you're doing now? Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's quite a, quite a journey and there's a mixed bag of things that I'm doing for sure. Um, so I started out in finance as a broker and that was back way in 1987. And it was the same year that Jordan Belfort started his career as a broker as the Wolf of Wall Street. And you know, things were pretty crazy back then. And I slipped into that industry sort of lifestyle very quickly. And what I found was that um, before long, I was incredibly stressed with uh, a lot of addictions. You know, there's a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs, a lot of partying. It was the wild, wild west of finance markets back then. And awesome. that led to some, you know, extreme sort of imbalances. I started getting a lot of anxiety and panic attacks and depression and insomnia. And so I, uh, by default, came across meditation uh, during that time. You know, I was sent to doctors and psychiatrists and put on pharmaceutical drugs, but I kind of felt deeply that there must be another alternative to that. So it was interestingly sort of divine intervention, maybe that the, the universe sent me a message to, to explore meditation. It was actually while I was watching TV and it was about a successful business developer or property developer that uh, was using meditation to, you know, help his success. And this was, you know, in the nineties and meditation was really unheard of back then. So it was like a light bulb moment for me. And it really was a game changer for me. My life turned, you know, in a big way. 
after learning to meditate and embracing that on a daily basis. But, you know, I continued on as a broker for many years. You know, I, I kept working for another 16 more years in the same company on a oh. trading room floor, yelling and screaming every day. But what I found was that the more I dived deeper into meditation and that journey of, um, you know, managing the mind and spirituality and Eastern philosophy, I started to realize more and more that there was something really, really powerful in this that um, needed to be brought to the world in a big way. And so I had a very strong passion to um, bring this into the households of the world. And so I left finance and started to teach meditation. And uh, it was initially just one-on-one -on -one and in small groups teaching them to meditate. And then I just realized that I wanted to scale this and I, you know, all of a sudden the internet arrived on the scene and I wanted to start creating some online programs. And then I started running retreats and started working with corporates. And that allowed me to, with things like Zoom, start to accessing companies all around the world. So I've been working with Amazon and Coca-Cola and Qantas and uh, some big companies uh, around the world to sort of help them reduce their stress in their workplace. So that's kind of how it's just morphed and evolved and grown over time. Wow. Well, so you're also the author of um, a handful of books. Is that correct? Yeah, and I've written a few books. One was The Portal, which came with the film um, that I produced. And uh, and then there was a few other, there's a kid's book and some other books on stress and um, spirituality. Gotcha. What, which ones would you say are the, uh, were the most impactful, would you say, for your audience? Look, I think the Portal book, which is on Amazon and um, a number of other platforms, uh, is a really powerful journey into six individual lives that have gone through crisis and turmoil. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, Jackie, who I worked with on the book and the film, that mm -hmm. is okay. a profound book that not just takes you through a moving journey of people's real life stories of hardship and turmoil and chaos, and then to come out the other side of that by using the tool of meditation. But it gives you some very powerful insights into the world and where the world's at and where the world could potentially be going, which is really a fork in the road. And we have three futurists in there, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Mikey Siegel, and Julia Mosbridge that share a very unique insight and perspective of the world that needs to be shared, I think, in a big way. So I think that's probably the, the best option out there. Yeah, so um, I, I did watch the movie. It was fantastic. There was some very powerful messages there. Um, and yeah, I, I guess one of the focuses of the movie would be this, this paradigm shift. Um, at least that's kind of what I uh, largely got from it. And, and, and I catch a lot of people talking about this paradigm shift. Why, why do you feel like this paradigm shift exists in the moment? And I guess also, why do you feel like it needs to happen? Hmm. It's a great question. Um, the paradigm shift is really a, um, a collection of individuals that are themselves going through a paradigm shift. You know, we, we have 7 billion people on the planet and, um, you know, we've seen cycle after cycle of rebirth and rebirth and generation after generation. But what we're seeing is in, uh, a, I guess, an exponential growth curve of transformation, you know, the level of change and progress. Like, for instance, having a Zoom a call on a podcast with someone in um, Baltimore, Maryland, and someone here in Sydney, Australia, talking about paradigm shifts, um, enables us to share information so rapidly and so globally that we've never had literally in the thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of years of human existence um, until just the last 10 years. <laughs> and so it's quite phenomenal how quickly we can share this information. And what can happen from that only is um, very rapid transformation. So for instance, another thing, I do a lot of coaching with conscious leaders and um, some of them get a little bit despondent. It's like, they feel like they're, you know, it's, it's hard to make headway. I said, well, look, you've got to remember that this idea of personal development, personal growth, transformation, spirituality in the households of the world is a very, very new phenomenon. Literally just, you know, 20 years, maybe 50 years old, if I don't, wouldn't say 50, but, you know, we're talking about conferences, retreats, people meditating, people doing yoga, mm -hmm. people doing coaching programs, people doing online coaching programs, people doing online educational programs, you know, before we woke up, we went to school, we went to university, we went to work, we went on holidays, then that was it. Um, whereas these days, there's a huge commitment to personal development and personal growth. And so right. from that, we can only see the extension and by default, the manifestation of that inner personal shift taking place in the outer world. That's the world that we create. And we talk a lot about this in the film that the, what, what we create is what we are. We are what mm -hmm. we create. 
And so as we change quite rapidly, then what we create is going to change. And this is going to, by default, create quite a significant paradigm shift. And it will usually come with a bit of challenge and turmoil. That's what we see often. Yeah, so one of the things that was mentioned in the movie that I found pretty um, pretty interesting, so you had this, this graph. Um, and I don't exactly remember exactly what it, it targets, but but generally speaking, you have a, grass, a, gra a graph of people um, stepping into their higher self and things getting better and better. And then you also have a graph a graph of um, all this chaos and turmoil. And, you know, seemingly these two things are going in two very different directions simultaneously in this world. And um, I, 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 it's just interesting where, where is this going to land? Where is this going to take us? Because I feel like there's one extreme and then there's the other extreme and we're just getting further and further into two extremes. Um, how is this going to play out? It's a good question. Um, and we, I've talked to a lot of climate scientists and a lot of, uh, people that do a lot of research into, you know, humanity and future forecasting and things like that. There's some great organizations. Uh, one called humanity X, uh, is a great organization that are very long-term forecasters and futurists that look ahead at humanity. And, um, there's quite a few other organizations that do this as well. And it's not quite clear what we see in, in the future just yet as to whether we, we have that survival capability, whether we get through to the next paradigm, the next paradigm can be remarkably beautiful. Um, so look, it's a, it's something we can dive deep into a little bit to succinctly put this, uh, into short term is that there's a, a Vedic terminology called Kali Yuga, the age of ignorance, which is where we're at now. And that's, uh, where the actions that we, we, um, make and take uh, quite often are fairly detrimental because we do them with very short-sighted perspectives for our own personal mm -hmm. gain, whether it's an individual, political party, a corporation. We generally do it for our own personal pursuits um, because it's very hard for us to consider the whole when we're sort of driven by our own personal needs and that affects the outcomes of what we, what we do. But in a more awakened, enlightened society, we have greater perspective and greater capacity to integrate others meaning other humans and other animals, other plants and the planet itself into our decision-making process. So what we're looking at is we're not quite clear yet whether we will see a bifurcation point, um, which is uh, up-leveling to a new world order, not, not a new world order, that's not a, the right terminology, a new way of doing things in the world, Okay. Um, which is coming from a new state of consciousness because we're expanding and changing our state of consciousness very quickly. But if we don't adapt quickly enough, we'll see a rapid deterioration of things on the planet, which will be, um, you know, a lot more conflict, which is what we're seeing a lot more severe weather patterns, which is what we're seeing, and uh, a lot more limited um, resources, which is what we're seeing as well. And if we continue on that path without adapting it quickly enough, then we could potentially see the termination of a species. Well, you know, I, I've also heard the theory that, I mean, all the chaos that we're going through right now, we actually need that chaos to open up more people's eyes to what can be. I mean, you need a lot of people really need to go down to the depths be, before they can rise to the surface. And I'd, I'd like to believe that's where we are. Um, we're, you know, diving to the depths in hopes that we will come out rising to the surface on the other end, that it'll in turn open people's eyes to what the possibilities are. And that was the crux of the film. You know, we, we, the film and the book really wanted to show that um, crisis is actually a mechanism for evolution. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we tend to wait till crisis because I it, it sort of was built around my story and I went into the deepest, darkest night where I hit my bi bifurcation point. So a bifurcation point is an engineering term where something sort of reaches that point, say metal with um, the, the pressure or the weight of something. And, and it sort of gets to that point where it, it can't take the load anymore. It's tipping and point. It's tipping point. Yeah. So mm -hmm. for me, you know, I reached a bifurcation point, a tipping point where it was like contemplating whether I wanted to keep living my life or up level and change things dramatically so that I can live in a whole new paradigm. And we see companies reach a tipping point, they either break down into bankruptcy or they break through with a new way of doing things. We see relationships mm -hmm. get to a tipping point where they either break down into divorce or they break through into whole new levels of doing things. And unfortunately, humankind tends to be quite stubborn and resistant. And so we wait till that tipping point before right. we either break down or break through. Now, what we 
are hoping that will happen is that we don't get to such an idea, such a, a crisis point for humanity. We're not quite at that tipping point yet. It's not bad enough yet for us to see dramatically why we need to change everything that we're doing. Um, and hopefully it doesn't get to that point of it being bad enough. Hopefully we can adapt more quickly. So in the movie, um, you've referenced that a typical person has a kind of a network of friends of about 150 people and, or correct me if I'm, I'm framing this wrong, a network of friends or, or, or and family that we kind of influence about 150 large number of people. That's a, a direct connection and we would show love and support and, and, and affect them accordingly. In a Buddhist practice, um, and I, I found this really interesting, they reach out of this, this limitation and they reach out to anyone and everybody with this feeling of love and support. And, and that is kind of the philosophy we need to really bring in this higher consciousness, this higher connection to, I guess, expand this consciousness in a positive way. Yeah, look, the Dumba number of 150 is really interesting, because if you look at what, what sort of, I guess, is the characteristic of that 150, you know, that what they noticed was that tribes would basically sort of get to that point of 150, 200 before that sort of would split because they, they didn't have the capacity to know more and connect with more people than that at a particular point in time. But what we're finding why Buddhist practices can transcend that and, and experience deep love and connection with vast numbers of people is it's experiential. And that's because of their meditation practices. And that's why I made mm -hmm. the film to, you know, I guess, introduce meditation in a bigger way to the world and realize the importance of it. Because the Dunbar number is about how you know someone physically, mentally and emotionally. So that's individually and you need to locally have that connection with that person to know them physically, mentally or emotionally. But to know someone energetically, spiritually, is to connect with them at a subtler level. And we call this in Sanskrit, the Gyan Khand layer. It's a layer of um, unmanifested reality. And it's what Einstein would call the unified field. And so there is this unified interconnected field that when we transcend the physical, mental and emotional reality of our own individual need and existence, we by default start to experience this connectivity with other being other animals, plants and humans at a level that you can't really describe, you just know it's there. And so it's very hard to start to harm or hurt or feel anything but love and connectivity with other because you are actually experiencing other as you. It's an extension of you just as the finger and the toe are interconnected in the body. And so my intention is to bring meditation and inspire people to meditate more because when we start to meditate, we start to transcend physical, mental and emotional field and access this interconnective web of unification. And that allows us to be a lot more caring, kind and compassionate with others. Right. So there was a, a mention in the movie, it says to feel connect, to feel connected to other people, you first need to be connected to yourself. And that really resonated to me because I, I think, I mean, Karma Hub is largely about trying to heal the inner self what I'm trying to do. I mean, cause they're there. I, I went through a, a kind of a similar path as you, I went through a, a series of hard knocks and um, on the other side, everything was amazing. And I learned a lot of stuff and I created new awarenesses. And unfortunately, a lot of people do not have many of these awarenesses. And uh, for me, it, it wasn't meditation. It was energy work, Reiki work. Um, it kind of opened my eyes. Um, I do now meditate. Um, actually, I, I struggle to meditate, but it is a practice that I try and, and practice. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I think that's a fantastic statement that you really need to learn to connect to your inner self. And then you can more easily, like you were saying, learn to connect to others energetically and spiritually outside yeah, you of know. your 150 large. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the, the dilemma that we face on the planet right now is um, one of the greatest uh, epidemics we've ever seen is an epidemic of distraction. And we're so distracted from our inner self, our inner being, because we're scrolling through news feeds, we're wiping left and right on Tinder, we're, you know, listening to Spotify, watching Netflix, and there's nothing wrong with the delights and joys and pleasures of the outside world. 
But at the moment, we're so deeply obsessed about it being the source of identity, the source of fulfillment, that we've forgotten to look in the most important place of where it really, really exists, and that's within. And it sounds very cliched, but that's ultimately the journey that we all need to make. And it was the one that I was ignoring for a long time as well. But my life changed dramatically when I started to meditate and that quieting of the mind, that withdrawing from the senses that are absorbing the outside world to realize something within that I never knew was there before. And when I discovered that, I went, oh my goodness, all of my addictions was really me looking for this, this here inside me. And that joy, that bliss, that love is an innate essence. It's not something we get from the external world. It's something that's innate within us all. And at the moment, we have a very large portion of the world's population still not realizing what lies within them. Right. Yeah, so a quote that I picked up from the, the movie is, one of the biggest bottlenecks in the creation of tools that can deeply support transformation and healing on this planet is the state of mind of the creators, which of course is us, right? Um, each one of us individually. Uh, many people don't even know that their inner space exists. That is what is missing for people. And, and that's what can help facilitate the shift if they just dive into themselves and then in turn, be able to connect better with others. Yeah, it's it's actually the only thing that's in my mind that's going to uh, prevent us from <laughs> self termination. Uh, you know, we we did a screening of our film in Davos at the World Economic Forum and talking to a lot of people that were looking to make changes in the world. And I, I said the challenge you have is that you're trying to impose changes into a a population, a civilization, a global civilization that is in a fairly static mindset. You know, they're, they're still not. Um, you know, realizing what's yeah. within them. And, and so therefore it's very hard to sustain that, you know, introduction of a new idea, a new way of doing things. Right. And look, that's not to say we're not seeing rapid evolution. We are seeing a lot of progress and change, which is really exciting, but um, we're seeing a lot of technological change. And this is the problem that we talk about in the film. We're developing technology with a state of mind that's fairly stagnant. And, um, and this is, this is the problem that we, if we don't have developing consciousness and we have developing technology, then that can start to lead to a problem with the technology that we're creating. So where, where do we go from here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, like you were saying, I, I, I'm seeing more and more, um, programs of health and wellness, mindfulness, um, you know, touch base with your inner self. Um, it's, it's popping up all over the place and, and it's fantastic. Right. Um, but that still seems to be a very small percentage compared to the number of people that are just, they're stuck in the old rut. They're doing the same things over and over and over again. And they're not happy. At least hmm. that seems to be my experience, what I seem to, to witness. Yeah, look, I, I think it's it's easy to get despondent and throw the you know the towel in uh, and think that there's there's no hope. But there's it's really really exciting what's happening. It's just it's not happening the way we would expect it to happen. What we normally expect to happen is political leaders, business leaders, um, you know, voices in the world uh, at higher levels would normally be the ones that determine change. And right. because we're not seeing that from those people, you know, they pretty much are continuing on down the same path. Particularly here in Australia, you know, we've got a uh, Prime Minister of our country that is defiant and adamant that we stick with coal, uh, that we don't use one of the sunniest countries in the world, you know, uh, huge solar uh, in innovation. Um, there's wow. so many different things we could be doing here, but there's this, there's this rigidity to change. Um, and that's understandable. You know, I can see why these people get stuck in the way they do things because, you know, they're trying to respond to a collective mindset. So the change can only come from the ground up. It can only come from individuals shifting their own consciousness. And what we're seeing is that instead of it coming from the top down, it's actually going to come from the bottom up. And as the masses start to demand more and better, then you'll have to, then they'll put pressure on the, uh, the organizations, the political leaders, the business leaders. And we're going to start to see people um, as we shift our consciousness, because it is changing very quickly. You know, as you say, you know, we've got online programs and retreats and coaching and Zoom calls and podcasts, it's phenomenal what's happening. And this is really only five, 10 years old. So, you know, right. if we look at that curve, we'll see that in another five, 10, 15, 20 years, I mean, the change is gonna be phenomenal. And the expectation on business leaders and political leaders to, um, 
to represent a new status quo that the masses are demanding is going to start to happen. And we're seeing this, you know, not long ago, we had 60,000 school kids take a day off school to protest in the middle of Sydney about climate change and coal. Mm. And, you know, the, the youth of the world are really, really exciting. Yeah, look, these sort of things, it's, it takes time and it's, it's hard because people can give up because they can see that their political leader is not making any decisions on it, mm. you know, that, that have been influenced by that. And that's because he's got a coal industry um, that is just basically putting a lot of money into his political campaign. So he's not going right. to change his decision at this point in time. But maybe the next political leader will, uh, you know, if he gets voted out and slowly over time, the collective has greater demands, then political leaders in democratic societies really have to represent ideally the collective otherwise they're just not going to get voted in no. um now they do have a lot of biz businesses in their pocket because the big businesses are funding their political i, I know and that that's un unfortunately that's the case you know from, from my perspective i feel like the political leaders are um listening to the people less and less mm -hmm. um but maybe that's because i'm i'm just steering down a, a very different path than a lot of people i know I don't know. I, I really hope they make some changes. Um, I, I hope they listen to the people more. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's a slow process. That's for sure. I guess um, it's it's slow in our world terms, but it's mm -hmm. fast in civilization terms. And so, um, okay, fair enough. We've we've got some some definitely some headwinds and some challenges ahead. Um, the resistance in the the upper echelons of what we see as leadership in the world, but. Um, the stuff that's happening at the grassroots is really exciting. Uh, for instance, we had some very severe flooding in a region of New South Wales here in um, Australia. And we saw a, an absolutely diabolical response from the government and um, and this really poor organization and, and decision-making um, through that process. You know, thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of homes had been completely wiped out, thousands and thousands of people um, homeless living in you know school halls. Oh. And there was very, very little organization and input from the government. And what happened was fascinating. What happened was the community actually banded together, you know, private helicopters, uh, private trucks, pri private bulldozers, um, teams and teams of people cleaning out houses, volunteers coming in from all over Australia, um, you know, community sort of organizational skills just oh. jumping in and you know taking control and realizing that the government's not there to help them out. And it shouldn't have to be that way. But right. what we're seeing is this early, and I said to a few of my friends that live in that community, interestingly, it was a very spiritual and awake community that it happened to. Um, and I said to them, you know, there's probably a reason why you guys got chosen for this experience, because you're representing what's going to happen in the world going forward. It will be a new strategy of self-governance where people are going to go, hang on a sec, I don't think that this government is really representing me. and I don't think they're supporting me. So maybe right. we need to sort of work this stuff out ourselves and show that, hey, um, see how you go we, we we got this ourselves and we're going to manage this and so i think this is a very early stage of a new situation of um humankind starting to reorganize itself of its own accord and not waiting for some person in power that's been uh, put in there by some large organizations that are self-interested i think we're going to see um some very dynamic shifts taking place and we're seeing that in media i hope so uh, which is, you know, the advent of social media. We're seeing that in, in banking and finance with the advent of cryptos. And True. We'll, we'll start to see this in new forms of self-governance where communities are going to start to take a little bit more autonomy. Oh, I hope so. Hmm. <laughs> We're going to have so. to, I think. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. Well, this has been really fantastic. Is there anything else that you wanted to hit on before we uh, started to wrap things up? Yeah, look, I think it's it's just wanted to, I guess, re-emphasize it's I don't want to leave people with a sense of despondency and despair. You know, it's so easy to feel, um, I guess, in this world where we have access to so much news and so much information. And it's easy to focus as we tend to on the negative and think that things are really diabolical. But things are actually really, really exciting. We're seeing phenomenal shifts and um, you have to scratch beneath the surface because you're not going to get this in the mainstream news. They don't sell news. Um, with good news, <laughs> they right. sell news with bad news. And so it's easy to sort of have a lopsided perspective of the world. But crisis is really an evolutionary force. There's an intelligence that plays out where every single thing that is happening, whether it seems to be good or bad, is actually happening for evolution, for the awakening, for realization, for harmony, greater organization. And it just so happens that sometimes it might have some negative karmic experiences or karmic consequences, but it's like a little kid the analogy I use this for my, my clients and students is this. 
if little Johnny's a four, four or five year old kid and he's playing with a, a knife and a PowerPoint socket thinking this is really good fun, sticking this knife in the PowerPoint socket. And um, this beautiful loving mother that absolutely adores little Johnny so much that um, she's quite concerned for his survival. And his, her main primary objective is to help Johnny survive and live a really good life. And so this intelligence that oversees Johnny, the mother might have to give little Johnny a little stern warning. Hey, Johnny, please do not play with that knife in that PowerPoint socket. Um, you know, that's not good for you. Now, if Johnny continues to play with that knife in that power socket, thinking if I can just get that knife a little bit further down that little hole here, um, mom's gonna sort of step in again and say, look, uh, this is your last warning. Johnny, I'm telling you now, if you do that again, there will be severe consequences. Now, Johnny, of course, is very stubborn and has his desires that continually drive him and he ignores this information that's coming through because it's just a warning, so I can ignore that. And so he continues to do this. And then eventually what's going to happen is severe repercussions. And mother, even though she loves him so, so much, she might uh, bestow some wrath on him and it might be a smack. It might be removing his toy, his knife. It might be removing him from the situation. It might be quite unpleasant consequences. Now, if one was to take a very small slither of time and look at mother having this retribution on this child for his naughtiness, um, because she loves him and she doesn't want him to do it again, um, my, some might say, well, this is terrible. This poor child has been absolutely brutalized by this mean, mean person. But really what's happening is there's so much love and kindness there. But uh, And this is what I think is a maternal energy and force across the planet and the universe itself that is here to support and nourish us. But if we're kind of a bit lost and if we're just not doing the right thing, which is what we're doing, if we're not working out how to be healthy, how to get on together, how to coexist with the planet, then there will be some karmic consequences from this beautiful loving force, which is trying to support us to realize the path we should be on and not the path that we're currently on. And one of the things I just finished with is that, you know, if we can find some time each day, just whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, ideally 20 minutes, for me, it's twice a day, 20 minutes to close our eyes, withdraw our mind from the external world and the inter the external stimulation and just sit in a meditation practice. If you haven't got one, try and find one that you can do and Im implement a meditation uh, into your daily life and it will make a huge difference for sure. <laughs>